Bom dia a todos e a todas. É um prazer, irmão, recebê-los em nome da Escola da GV Direito SP. Antes de mais nada, eu gostaria de registrar que as manifestações expressas pelos integrantes dos quadros da Fundação Júlio Vargas, os convidados que participam dos eventos e transmissões online, representam exclusivamente as opiniões de seus autores e não necessariamente a posição institucional da FGV. Reiteramos também que todos aqui presentes concordaram em participar desse evento de forma espontânea, e, com isso, autoriza o uso de sua imagem para essa transmissão, que ficará é, disponível posteriormente nos canais oficiais da FGV. Esse evento será conduzido em inglês para benefício da construção do diálogo direto com os nossos convidados. E agora, deve ser para o inglês, para que possamos ter um direct diálogo com nossos convidados aqui hoje. E eu gostaria de começar by opening the floor to an introduction by professor Oscar Vilena Vieira, our dean at the Law School and the most enthusiastic supporter of the project to translate the book, Corruption and Government, Causes, Consequences and Reform into Portuguese by Susan Rose Ackerman and Bonnie J. Politica. So Oscar, the floor is yours. Thank you, Caio. It's an immense pleasure to, to be here. I would like to welcome all of you that are taking part in this uh, conference and this uh, book launching that opens uh, uh, the conference. I would like also to thank uh, my dear friends, Machado, uh, Raquel Pimenta, and Kevin Davis for organizing this conference and uh, would have a particular words to thank to Caio Mayo and to uh, Professor Marieta, who is the editor chief of FGV uh, to uh, make this translation uh, feasible, possible, and available for us uh, uh, today. Obviously, I uh, would like to welcome uh, uh, participating in this event and so enthusiastically waiting uh, for the long time that took to translate and publish uh, uh, the book. Uh, it is, uh, unfortunately, a very uh, opportune time to return to discussion about corruption in, in Brazil today. Uh, uh, the cycle of Lava Jato is probably ending uh, at this moment, and uh, a, a, a strong battle uh, around uh, its results both uh, uh, analytical battle about uh, uh, the consequences of this operation, but also an institutional and legal battle regarding how Brazil will move forward after this uh, uh, operation. So it is very important that we are doing this conference at this, uh, at, at this moment. Um, as you know, the original version of the book, the English version of the book. No, it is a, a seminal book that it, it will be launched today. It's a book that uh, provide us with several lenses to understand the phenomena of corruption from economics to political science and to legal and institutional studies. So it's a multidisciplinary book uh, that really uh, uh, 
is on the center of the debate about uh, corruption. The, the book also has uh, a, a, another quality, which is uh, a comparative analysis that it provides from many cases of anti-corruption operations and anti-corruption movements uh, around the globe. So it is a privilege for us uh, to hear both authors at this moment to present their book. But before passing the floor to both, I just would like to recall uh, uh, the last time uh, Susan uh, was at FGV, that was 2016. Uh, my friend and colleague Hubens Glaser uh, brought this to my memory another day. Uh, she uh, shared a panel with uh, at the moment, uh, uh, and he was presenting uh, very enthusiastically and proudly uh, the results of the Lava Jato, mostly providing numbers about people who were convicted, uh, the amount of money that was recollected, all uh, the innovations in the legal system that were introduced during the Lava Jato and mostly focusing on the criminal aspects of the operation. And Susan very respectfully and calmly uh, tried to bring uh, to the table and to the attention of the Attorney General that probably uh, uh, only legal uh, criminal measures would be insufficient uh, to make a real change in the area of corruption. And then uh, with a very, in a very patient way, uh, she provide uh, uh, an illustration or, or the results of the research that now is in the book about all the, the, the relations between the state and the private sector, uh, the question of competition, the questions of transparency. So I just recall that uh, uh, four years later, we are here and we are seeing the insufficiency of the criminal aspect of this operation. And we will have, uh, again, the privilege to hear the authors of, the, of this great book. So uh, without further ado, I will pass the floor to, to both of them to, help, uh, to, to again, thank uh, them for being with us at this moment and uh, to share with us as uh, some of the experience and, and that they, they got on this, on this research. So thank you very much and the floor is yours. Oscar, uh, let me just make a very brief introduction, uh, 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 Susan, as well, so that we can, we can uh, 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 just have this uh, as a bit of context. So I'd like to welcome as well, uh, Professor uh, Susan Rosakman, Professor Boni, uh, Jay Polivka, and Professor Cesar Rodriguez Gabarito to this webinar and the book launch. Uh, um, I first met Susan when I went to Yale Law School for my LLM in 2001. And then I had the honor to have her in part as part of my doctoral committee at Yale between 2002 and 2005. As mentioned by Oscar, we had the privilege to have Susan visiting our law school in 2016 when we came up with the idea to uh, have the translation of this book, uh, uh, which is finally uh, uh, concluded and, 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 and launched today. So it's my, my pleasure to introduce our guests uh, 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 um, before uh, giving the floor uh, to them. Let's start with Susan. Uh, Susan Rosakman uh, uh, is the Harry, Harry R. Luce uh, Professor Emeritus of Law and Political Science and Professorial Lecturer in, the law, uh, uh, in law at Yale University. She holds an MA in Philosophy and PhD in Economics from Yale University, as well as honorary degrees from the University of Maastricht uh, and the Universidad Peruana de Ciencias Aplicadas in Lima, Peru. She has published widely in the fields of law, economics, and public policy, and she has edited nine books on respects of corruption and administrative law, such as Corruption and Government Causes, Consequences, and Reform, the book that we're launching today in Portuguese in a second edition with Bonnie Palitka. Her research interests include uh, um, a wide area of subjects, including um, comparative regulatory law and policy and political economy of corruption, public policy and administrative law in law and economics. And now our, uh, the co-author of this uh, uh, book, Bonnie Politica. Uh, Bonnie is an associate professor at Tecnológico de Monterrey at Campus Monterrey and a lecturer at Yale University. 
She received a BA in economics from the University of Vermont and her master's and PhD in economics from the University of Texas at Austin. Bonnie is, is the creator of the Academia Against Corruption in the Americas Conference and is the co-author of the second edition of uh, the classic corruption document that we're launching today. Her current projects concern corruption in Mexico, Nuevo León's uh, state anti-corruption system, corruption and academic dishonesty, corruption and organized crime, and corruption and gender. Please, Susan Bonnie, it's a great pleasure to have you with us and the floor is yours uh, uh, for a presentation. Thank great. you. Thank you. Um, thank you uh, very much, uh, Bonnie and I are both very happy to be here. And of course, really uh, happy and flattered that um, uh, FJV um, took on the project of, of translating our book, uh, which we of course understand was a major project. It's a, it's a big book. Uh, and we're delighted that uh, to have it appearing in 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 in, uh, in Portuguese, and uh, and pleased that uh, you could organize a, a launch of the book uh, uh, before the concert, the, uh, the conference that's going to go on on the next um, the next few days. Um, <clears throat> so uh, just to pick up where Oscar uh, left off, um, he's exactly right that um, our approach to thinking about the problem is to say. Yes, the criminal law is important, but if you just focus on the criminal law, you're looking ex post at people who have done something that seems to violate the law and that doesn't get at the underlying uh, structural institutional problems that are creating uh, corruption, uh, corrupt incentives, uh, and, um, uh, and, um, and that that needs to be thought about. We need to, we need to think about how to, um, uh, wait a minute, I've got something that says I have to, all right, I'm all right. Um, that, uh, that if, if um, we start to think about the, um, um, the reasons why people are paying bribes and accepting bribes uh, or engaging in other related uh, activity, we're understanding so and something about the problems and the way the state is organized. So, um, and the, the book talks in detail about a lot of ways this can come up. Let me just very quickly um, summarize some and Bonnie will be talking about more later. So the, the, um, the first question is, or the first set of, of, of incentives have to do with government allocating of goods and services uh, to people and businesses, uh, often uh, many, many of them, for example, things like giving out licenses, giving out some kind of scarce public benefit, uh, housing, um, things which are not being sold in the market because of the desire to provide the benefits to people who are, who are worthy or needy. Um, but may create incentives for people to pay to get those scarce benefits or scare or, or pay to be labeled as qualified for something like a, a place in a university, um, a license to practice some kind of profession that um, they don't want to bother to get the qualifications, so they'll pay to uh, somebody to allow them to get those qualifications. So those can be sort of mass problems which um, depend upon the way in which the underlying system is organized. And, uh, and sometimes we can, we can reduce corrupt incentives by, uh, by reorganizing the, the, uh, the delivery of, of services. We have to be careful not to fall into the trap of thinking that the way to get rid of corruption is to sim simply shrink the size of the state. Yeah, that might do it, but you'd also have gotten rid of things that had, had very important benefits for, 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 for people. Then, of course, there are the set of very important forms of corruption that have to do, that are uh, uh, large scale and kind of one of a kind, right? So some of the examples in, 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 in Brazil, but also everywhere have to do with public procurement, uh, where the um, incentives for corruption may be embedded in the, in the fact that the, that the contracts are um, one of a kind, special purpose things, and may even have been designed that way by corrupt officials in order to create a space for, 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 for corruption. Um, um, so there is a, um, a particular problem that I think is you see throughout the world of, of corruption in, in, in government procurement that, that once again has to do not just with, with sort of uh, um, nasty people wanting to get involved, but has to do with the nature of the, th of the, of the things that the government is, is, is uh, is buying and that reform needs to think about, about that as well as just the, about, um, about, about, about law enforcement. Uh, you may have a situation where even if you have a firm 
that actually performs on the corrupt contract actually builds the bridge or constructs the factory or improves the port, the, the whole design of the program may be too, it may be too big, it may be too complicated, it may be designed in a way to hide the bribes um, just in the structure of the contract itself. And um, it's, it's important to, for states to recognize that set of incentives and, and deal with it. And, um, and then of course, the, um, the final issue that is, that is extremely important is the overlap between corruption wherever it shows up and the way in which the political system operates. So corruption can just occur in a simple way in people buying votes or in um, campaign finance uh, uh, going to, um, to uh, further corrupt uh, to further corrupt interests. Um, you have a special problem that um, uh, um, uh, Raquel and I have spoken about in another article in, 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 in Brazil of having so many political parties uh, and a need for uh, all needing some kind of, of some kind of, of political uh, um, uh, funding um, that leads to bribes being paid, which then may be passed on uh, to fill the coffers of, of various uh, political parties in getting uh, in, in supporting their electoral um, results. So that's a, just an example of how there can be interactions between corruption in one set of or one set of situations and other things that we care about. For example, a, a well a working, honest uh, 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 political system. Um, um, I did a paper a long time ago with a, a, a former a former student, uh, Yana Kunikova, uh, looking at the incentives for corruption in, in presidential systems with with a proportional representation in the in, in the legislature. Uh, something that echoes what you have in what you have in Brazil. So you have uh, it, 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 it just I mean it just is at least suggesting that um, that one thing to look at when you're thinking about anti-corruption activity is some honest way of, of, of financing uh, elections that is, is transparent and people can, can look at and see uh, and that is sufficient uh, so that there isn't the um, incentive for, 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 for uh, corrupt under the table in, 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 um, in, 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 in elections. Um, and, um, and, and finally, the issue is just of transparency of just people, ordinary people and civil society groups being able to know what the government's doing uh, under, you know, to look at government budgets, at the way the regulatory process, uh, regular regulatory process operates. Um, so I guess that's uh, I, 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 enough to hopefully encourage people to actually look at the book, which will be uh, on on uh, on the web uh, fairly uh, fairly soon. I guess I will purchase on the on the web and 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 physically in a couple of months. Um, so um, I'm thank you thank you very much. I'm gonna turn over to my co-author who I think has some, she's an expert on slides. Uh, I, she's <laughs> wonderful ones for me, for both of us in the past that I've used. So Bonnie. Thank you, Susan. And, and I'd like to thank the organizers of this presentation as well. It's, it's a wonderful opportunity for us all. I began using the first edition of Corruption in Government in 2004 in a course that I developed for the Tecnologico de Monterrey. I, chose this book because it was the most complete book that I could find at the time on on corruption. It was a course on the economics of corruption, but to me it was really important to include not only economics, which is makes up about half of the book, but also this book brings in politics and culture, sociology, history, and you really need to approach corruption from a multi- disciplinary perspective. So I, I really enjoyed this book and thought it was the best choice for the course that I was teaching. In 2011, I started teaching the same course at Yale University, and that's where I met Susan Rose Ackerman. Two years later, we decided that it was time to update this, this classic book and agreed to co-author the second edition. And so in 2016, the English edition was published by Cambridge University Press. It's been translated now to Chinese, Spanish, and we're very happy to announce the, the publication in Portuguese of this book. I've had friends asking me, when is it going to be out in Portuguese? And now I can say it's already available, at least as an ebook, and very soon in, in physical content. 
So for the second edition, we kept almost everything that was in the first edition because there were so many valuable lessons and cases and, and examples and insights that uh, Susan has given us an overview for in, in her portion of the comments. So, but we also, in updating this, we duplicated the size of the book by including new chapters or sections of chapters on cross-country measures of corruption, which were in their infancy when the first edition was was published, but now there are a plethora of options. And so we describe some of those in chapter one and in a special appendix. We include a subsection on e-governance, which again, it has really grown since the first edition was published. Uh, there's an appendix on the economic analysis of anti-corruption reforms. We've included some graphs that weren't in the first edition. Um, well, there's a new chapter on using the criminal law to deter bribery and extortion. There's also a new chapter on corruption, organized crime, and money laundering, inspired by Mexico's experience, but it applies it to a large degree in Brazil and many other countries as well. And there's a new chapter on corruption in post-conflict state building uh, that comes out of uh, research that uh, Susan Rose Ackerman had, had conducted. We also expanded the treatment throughout the book. So every single chapter was edited and updated. And in addition to that, we have included data to show relationships between variables. We have student-friendly diagrams because I use it as a textbook. Susan has used it as a textbook. And I know that several other professors and universities around the world also use this book as a textbook. So taking that into account, let's make it um, something that's, that's maybe a little more attractive to students. We have data graphs and seven boxed examples to illustrate the points that are being made in the text. We have updated and broader coverage of the cultural aspects of corruption, including the research on gender and corruption and how religion relates to corruption. We've also expanded the treatment of money laundering, not only in that special chapter on the relationships between corruption, organized crime, and money laundering, but also in reforms to address corruption by also addressing money laundering. Um, we have also expanded the, the role of the international community through conventions, the cooperation between authorities and including multinational enterprise. So we've, we're including the role of businesses in the second edition, which was not as important in the first edition. And there are, of course, many more references to Latin America throughout the book. In particular, for Brazil, there are references to civil service pay levels, corruption in forestry, corruption networks, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, land reform, municipal corruption, new public management reform, participatory budgeting, political corruption, privatization, procurement, and prosecutors. So a, a lot of references to Brazil. Here's an example of a student-friendly diagram showing the, the causes of consequences at the top of the diagram and the consequences at the bottom of the diagram and our central thesis that corruption occurs at the intersection of society-wide institutions, both formal and informal institutions, the incentives that are specific to a particular situation and personal ethics. And that therefore, in order to fight corruption, you need to reform all of these, as Susan indicated, it's not enough just to change the law. Here's some examples of our use of data in the book. So these are graphs that show different types of relationships between organized crime and corruption. And so to conclude, our central thesis again is that corruption occurs at the intersection of institutions, incentives, and personal ethics. And we need to keep this into account when engaging in anti-corruption reform. We need to involve not only government, but also firms and society. And so sustainable reforms will come, come together when political will from the top and at the intermediate 
levels of of government and and firms to a to a large extent because firms exert political power as well when that political will meets good laws and good policies and broad public support that's how we get sustainable anti-corruption reform so thank you very much to Susan for involving me in this project and allowing me to help bring this new addition to a whole new generation of readers and students. Uh, I'd also like to thank FGV for undertaking the project to translate. I'd like to thank the translator. And I'm especially happy that there is a, um, an edition available as an ebook in Portuguese. I think that's really important to, to reach more readers. Uh, I'd like to take advantage of this opportunity to invite those of you who are interested to join the Academia Against Corruption in the Americas group on LinkedIn. This is for scholars who are dedicated to anti-corruption. So thank you very much to everyone. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Susan and Bonnie. Uh, this was a great, uh, uh, great presentation. Uh, uh, and I think it, it, it puts forward the big thesis of the, the book and the importance of institutions in thinking broadly about how to fight corruption and, and how to think about reforms that can be actually effective, as mentioned by, by Oscar in the beginning. Before we turn to our commentator today, let me just remind the audience uh, that we will have a Q&A session in the end, uh, um, and you can use the tool of Slido uh, that you can find at the YouTube uh, 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 channel uh, to pose your questions so that we can uh, share the questions with uh, um, the authors and, and the commentators in the end so that we can uh, discuss. So now we turn to our commentator, Cesar Rodriguez Garavito. Uh, Cesar is the director of uh, the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice at NYU Law School. Cesar received a JD from the University of Los Angeles and an MA from NYU's Institute of Law and Society, an MA in Philosophy from the National University of Columbia, and an MS and a PhD in Sociology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Cesar was formerly uh, so an associate professor at the University of the Andes and had been a visiting professor at universities around the world. He has also been an adjunct judge uh, at the Constitutional Court of Colombia, a member of the science panel for the Amazon, and a lead litigator in climate change, social economic rights, and indigenous rights cases. He's the editor-in-chief of Open Global Rights and the co-editor of Cambridge University's Press Globalization and Human Rights book series. Cesar, thank you very much for being with us, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Caio. Thanks to Oscar and, and colleagues at FGV. It's a pleasure to be part of this event and, and comment, offer some comments and reflections on a very uh, thought-provoking book that's both a classic and, uh, and an open-ended research agenda. And uh, it's, uh, it would have, would have been, if had I been tasked with commenting on, on the book as a whole, that would have been almost an impossible enterprise because it's so rich. Now it's big as well. So I had read pieces, uh, some chapters, but I had not had the opportunity to read the entire book. So this was an opportunity to do that. And, and I agree with Bonnie that this is definitely can be used uh, as a textbook. And there is no way that you can comment on a textbook usefully. So I thought that I would um, choose a specific angle for my comments. Uh, and Basically, instead of commenting on the book, I'll comment on the fact that uh, we're launching here the Brazilian edition, the Portuguese translation of the book, uh, and refer to what happened since between the publication of the second edition of the book in 2016 and today. Uh, and second, um, try to use some um, evidence from Brazil that already is Susan and Boni have alluded to some of that, but uh, and Oscar also uh, wrote a great uh, paper for this conference on the Lava Jato and uh, the whole trajectory of that anti-corruption uh, anti -corruption effort. So uh, I'll do uh, precisely that, and uh, I'll focus on the post-2016 period. A lot has happened over the last five years, 
a lot has happened over the last five months, uh, but, uh, but I'll um, try to um, insert some um, comments that will hopefully get the co-authors to offer some reflections on, on how their hypothesis and their findings hold up when, in the light of uh, uh, new challenges for democracy and, and for governments around the world and certainly uh, Brazil. And I should say uh, to wrap up the introduction that uh, I'm not an expert in this particular topic. I come from uh, the work on sociology of institutions and constitutional law. Um, and uh, what, I, what struck me in reading this book from both angles is that it really is interdisciplinary. It begins with a more kind of economic uh, theory and methodology flavor, but then expands into a truly interdisciplinary uh, book that has the added advantage of being open to complex uh, causal frameworks, uh, uh, to contingent uh, reform uh, processes that are sensitive to uh, country-specific uh, 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 specific uh, political, economic, and social uh, context. Um, so the book is very difficult to pin down. No one will be, will be, will be able to say, well, there, you know, to shoot it down because it uh, puts all the ch chips on, uh, say, institutional reform as opposed to the reform on incentives or culture versus uh, uh, hard-nosed uh, political incentives and so on. So uh, with that in mind, let me offer uh, three uh, comments uh, for the authors to hopefully uh, reflect on. Um, so over the last five years, one of the major political developments has been the rise of populist authoritarianism, not least in Brazil, of course. So the fact that we've seen both on the right and the left, uh, the rise of democratically elected governments that have, have gone on to very effectively undermine the very conditions, institutional conditions for meaningful democracy and rule of law to operate. You know, from Brazil to India, from Venezuela to Nicaragua, from Turkey to Hungary and so on, uh, we've seen the rise of what uh, political scientist uh, Jan Werner Müller calls um, populist authoritarianism, right? And one uh, could characterize as he does populist authoritarianism as a combination of anti-elitism and anti-pluralism. The net effect is that the a discourse and a politics of high polarization, us versus them, takes hold in ways that um, are truly uh, unprecedented if we take into account that those uh, moves, political moves to polarize the policies have been aided, amplified by digital technology. And again, Brazil, with the ongoing debate on what happened and on WhatsApp in 2018 and, uh, and the uh, ongoing harassment of independent journalists uh, by trolls uh, associated with the government or associated with different uh, sectors in civil society uh, is, is a prime example of that. So the, the question and the comment for um, Susan and, and Boni is, well, does tribalization, the, frag the radical fragmentation and siloing of the public sphere um, raise new challenges or opportunities for anti-corruption work. Uh, one can see, and this is, I'll wrap up this comment by pointing in two possible uh, directions, uh, but of course, I'm sure that the co-authors will have much more interesting ways to look at this. Uh, first one is, paradoxically, anti-corruption efforts have been uh, some of the catalysts for the rise of populist authoritarian government, right? So uh, we know that the current government in, 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 in Brazil or in India, they run those candidates on anti-corruption platforms. And, and in page 428 of the English edition of the book, um, um, the co-authors, point to this in passing, right? They, they call this the anti-corruption paradox, right? This is the thing that we have seen good governance coup d'etat, like in Fujimori in Peru in the 1990s. So corruption and the fight against corruption can be captured and used very effectively to um, then um, basically bulletproof 
candidates and leaders who are seen going, is going against the old established, the old populist, the old um, corrupt establishment uh, as being beyond any form of public criticism and for them to go on and enact corrupt policies themselves. So uh, corruption may be seen both, anti-corruption may be seen both as a cause uh, of the rise of populist authoritarian government, but also um, end up playing a key role in the maintenance uh, of the stain of power of those populist authoritarian leaders. Um, so if, you, if we look, for example, changing completely the geography of examples, what's happened in, in Turkey, right? So uh, the effort to hold Erdogan accountable for uh, allegedly uh, corrupt dealings that the sectors of his government had uh, been involved in led to backlash that because of the polarization of the polity and the very heavy handed uh, way in which Erdogan had gone after the opposition, ended up entrenching uh, Erdogan uh, in power. And the fact that uh, the public sphere is so divided, so tribalized, not only in Turkey, but think about the US or uh, the UK or Australia or Brazil and, and India and so on, creates what some authors have called kind of a Teflon effect, right? So corruption, anti-corruption efforts may end up affecting um, may, be, may, may end up be used, uh, being used against the opposition while not affecting much those leaders who continue to have the aura of uh, being anti-corrupt, anti-corruption leaders, uh, but are effectively exempted from those institutions. Um, so to put it in, in succinct terms, is there anything specific about this type of political regime um, that we should uh, take into account in analyzing the uh, current uh, efforts to hold governments accountable to uh, rules of the game that uh, create obstacles for corrupt dealing. My second uh, common question has to do with another uh, development that we've seen on the rise over the last uh, five years, which is inequality, economic inequality. Again, across uh, uh, the world, um, both in the global south and the global north, we've seen the, uh, the rise of uh, uh, in-country uh, inequality associated with many factors that we won't go uh, into now. The key thing here is that because clientelism has been called the, the a friendship among unequal parties, right? And because uh, the accumulation of power in the hands of, say, corporate actors, say the big tech in the US or, or other um, in economic sectors in other countries, uh, fossil fuel companies and so on, uh, create uh, an enormous risk as the book rightly analyzes for capture of political institutions and, and for the exemption of those um, sectors, economic sectors from uh, anti-corruption efforts. The question is, is, is increasing inequality uh, creating a different type of challenge that the book uh, uh, um, comments on in terms of dealing with corruption. The book uh, nicely deals with uh, the potential association between inequality and corruption in that corruption may be a catalyst or may be a determinant of inequality. Right, then and the authors go through the empirical um, evidence about that potential uh, direction of the association. So flipping the uh, relationship, the question would be, is rising inequality, uh, does rising inequality create new challenges and what type of challenges for the fight against corruption? And finally, um, and, uh, and, and more prospectively, I wanted to bring and let me see if I can share my screen here. Um, in Brazil, and, and the FGV Law School has a law and development uh, master's program. There's a long standing debate on law and development. Uh, and the book points in this direction at 
various moments, but I thought that it would be great to have Bonnie and, um, and Susan comment on this at a bit uh, greater length. Uh, I'm taking this from Peter Evans's book uh, that's referenced in the, um, in the publication, in the volume, um, his book on embedded autonomy. And he wrote this book, he published this book back in the early 1980s using Brazil as one of his empirical uh, examples, case studies. And basically he, what he captured and became kind of a classic typology in the sociology of development is a, is a dilemma uh, uh, for any state trying to uh, advance uh, um, in terms of, uh, uh, to promote developmental um, policies and programs. Uh, so one, and he, the typology here is very simple. Um, the dilemma is that states need to have competent bureaucracies. Uh, this is the horizontal axis here. So relatively rational, uh, competent bureaucracies, Bavarian uh, uh, bureaucracies, but they also have to, the state institutions have to interact with corporate actors and civil society to get them to do what needs to be done for those policies, say, of, of the development of specific economic sectors um, like tech or back in the day textiles for them to actually achieve the levels of international competitiveness that are needed for development to take off. Yep. And, and uh, what's interesting here, and this is what I'll uh, wrap up with, is that the developmental state, at least in, the, in, in Evans's uh, framework, was seen as a combination of uh, high levels of rationality in state bureaucracy and high levels of embeddedness, of cooperation, of interaction with uh, uh, the economic elite and, and, uh, and rising uh, economic actors, uh, and this would be the winning combination. And, and when this book was published, the prime example was South Korea, right? And it would be, but today, uh, of course, uh, most case studies would point to, to China. And on the other side of this typology, one would find these are the easy cases, all these extremes are uh, easier to characterize in terms of ideal types. The predatory state uh, has low um, degree of embeddedness and low degree of, um, of, uh, of rationality in bureaucracy. But the more interesting categories and the ones that probably most Latin American states uh, fall under and probably Brazil are in these two uh, other uh, cells, right? So one, could see uh, the uh, dilemma of what's happened uh, in Brazil and the response of a lot of the political uh, elite uh, in the prior government as a response to this dilemma, saying, well, in order for Brazil to take off, and in order for those economic uh, outcomes of the uh, last 10 years before, the, before Dilma Rousseff was uh, forced to leave office, well, were an effort to develop and consolidate a competent bureaucracy uh, that, and that was inherited that effort from previous government, certainly Fernando Henrique Cardoso, but then also an effort to uh, have fluid relationships with key economic actors. And fluid here, of course, could mean corrupt deals or it could mean virtuous um, dealings based on the right economic incentive. So if um, it would be, I'd be very interested in, in having or hearing any, listening to any reflections that Bonnie and, um, and Susan might have about what type of combination you would see as producing a type of result that towards the end of the book, uh, you offer as a menu, a, you know, a very diverse menu for reform. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Cesar. Very uh, interesting comments and, and, and excellent uh, questions. Before I turn back to the, to the authors, I'd just like to remind uh, 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 the audience that we're gonna have a Q&A uh, session uh, 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 after the reaction of the authors. Uh, so please do send your questions uh, uh, through Slido. It's right below the video and in the YouTube channel. 
uh, and then we can forward this and we can, I can uh, uh, actually read the questions uh, to the authors and uh, the commentator. So I'll turn the floor back to Susan and Bonnie now uh, to, to react and, and respond to Cesar. Thank you very much again. Okay, I'll say a few words. So thank you for putting this, what we're doing in a kind of very much broader uh, context of kind of state performance, right? Uh, I point out that even though this book is very long, we are not really trying to solve all the problems of, of state performance, but it's certainly right to ask how uh, a fight against corruption should fit into that. Um, uh, just a couple of things to say. Um, the, um, it's of course uh, true in some of the uh, countries um, that what you, what you call populist authoritarian, I, some of these are populist democracies. Um, they're, they're risky versions of this, but they're not all that way. And why they're occurring, some, some of the re reasons for the success of, of politicians in some of these countries is related to your second comment, which has to do with uh, high levels of inequality and a status quo which has favored a very small elite, right? So if you have a system where a very small elite is running things, but it's all very calm and everything's all very nice. Well, you know, it's it's it may be calm, but it is uh, it's it's uh, it, it's it's nobody's ideal of what a, at least not mine of what a of what a state should should be should be like. Um, so of course you're right to point out that there can be this this kind of paradox um, well, of regime change. Um, kind of partly supported by an anti-corruption activity, but which then ends up sort of backfiring in, 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 in some ways. But I think we need to be careful to, to look at uh, what the underlying conditions were that, that, had, that, that produced some kind, of a, some kind of a change. And it's also related, I guess, to your second point of, you're pointing to something which, uh, which we point out quite a bit, um, which is that the causal arrows go in both directions in most cases. We have, you know, what we call, an, what in economics you call simultaneous equation problem, right? I mean, there's a, um, corruption, high levels of corruption are leading to low levels of economic growth and perhaps high levels of inequality, but high levels of inequality and low growth can produce high levels of, of at least incidents of, 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 of corruption. And these are things are, you know, are kind of bound in, uh, bound in, 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 in together. Um, uh, your, your and I, you know, your uh, it's basically a similar point about your about Peter Evans' uh, uh, two by two, uh, two by two table, right? Which is alternative ways in which you can think about the relationship between what's going on in the rest of society. Of course, it's, you know, the 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 um, these are like any two by two table uh, oversimplified. I mean, there's there's a lot of different versions <coughs> of both. <coughs> Weberian versus non Weberian uh, bureaucracies. And on the other side, I think a, a lot of very interesting questions about the relationship between different kinds of social institutions, business, NGOs, um, very local groups that are organized for um, providing you know, goods and services to people at the local level and the extent to which they can be in tension uh, with, uh, with the government trying to impose some kind of more rational uh, uh, um, system on what's, on what's going on. You know, an important part of the of the law and development or uh, literature, um, which we of course don't take on as full of beauty, um, is that question of the relationship between uh, historical, traditional, culturally embedded ways of doing things, which may be very unfair, may treat women terribly, may uh, limit the up, the the put a, a ceiling on growth, but are letting people survive. Uh, versus coming in with more set of rationalistic ways of, 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 of dealing things. And I take those as, as important, serious problems that are behind what we're talking about. But, but um, I, we're, we're, not, we, it is, we're certainly not trying to solve all the problems in the world. And we're open <laughs> to your efforts to do so through your, through your work at NYU. So thank you, Bonnie. Thanks. Uh, really good questions. Um, as Susan pointed out, there are vicious circles or vicious uh, virtue uh, I'm sorry vicious circles or vicious spirals between corruption and inequality and we point out a number of vicious circles and vicious cycles vicious spirals throughout the book um, I think that your first question does radical fragmentation of public of the public raise new opportunities for anti-corruption work if, if you're using the word 
opportunities in the, the popular way that means challenge, then I think I think so um, because it's it's going to be harder to pull society together to fight corruption in, in that way. I think that um, as as we've seen, especially throughout Latin America, a number of regimes coming to power on anti-corruption platforms and then laughing in the face of anti-corruption efforts and undermining institutions uh, have, have demonstrated that it goes beyond just one person. I think too many of these societies are depending on their president to solve the corruption problem at when, when the problem in many of these countries is much more systemic and so we need to really address the systemic problems of corruption rather than focusing on individuals certainly punish those individuals that are found to be to be engaging in corruption but if all you're doing is imprisoning president after president you're not really getting at the root of the problem and so you need to address those institutional and incentive areas as well and and not focus only on the personal ethics of whoever happens to be in power at the time um, if you don't if you don't change those underlying institutions then then you're just going to end up with more and possibly even worse leaders um, so the second question was what, what about inequality we already already more or less addressed that the capture of political institutions by the elite is another rising issue throughout Latin America. And, and it's especially alarming the extent to which organized crime is starting to capture many of these, of these governments, especially at the local level. And so that's something else to watch out for, especially in the, the pandemic contingency. Um, that, that's something else to really be on the lookout for because governments are not fulfilling their role. And as we indicate based on on other literature, um, when corruption leaves a vacuum, organized crime occupies that vacuum and fulfills the roles that government should be fulfilling. So we need to really watch out for those, those kinds of opportunities that are being grasped by non-governmental entities like businesses and organized crime. Hope, hope that answers your Thank you very much, uh, Bonnie and Susan. Uh, uh, um, so we still have uh, about 20 minutes and I'd like to thank all the guests for, for being exactly on time and, and everything that we arranged. So we're really uh, uh, running uh, in, uh, on, on time and what we prepared. Um, so we're going to have a Q and A session now. I received a few questions here, uh, um, and I'm going to pose the questions, and maybe we could hear the authors. And also, says that please feel absolutely free to jump in and, and participate in the conversation here, Oscar as well. Um, so our, our first question here, I think, has a connection with uh, the first comment from Cesar. and and the question is, how do you see car washes use of the media, including social media? and the fact that it potentially made room for anti-democratic sentiments to be galvanized. So it's, it's kind of connected to that discussion of authoritarian leaders that we're just having uh, with Cesar here, but focused on the media and, and the social media uh, uh, used in, in car wash. Um, so the floor is yours, uh, Susan, Bonnie. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know anything about how the media used it. Um, I'd be very cautious uh, are doubtful uh, th that um, the state should be um, controlling the media because it has it, uh, it, it ends with the risk of, of shutting down important voices. So we're, to some extent, we're going to be stuck with, uh, with, with, uh, with, with, with people who probably most of us would not um, think much of. Um, but um, it, but it, it also, I think, points out the importance of the of the prosecutors themselves or the rest of the government being engaged in encountering or, or also um, uh, engaging with the engaging with the public. But as I said, I don't know what happened in this in, in Brazil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, um, I, th I think the reference of the, uh, as I can read the, the question here, I think the reference is, is really about prosecutors and people involved in the Operation Car Wash themselves using social mm -hmm. media and the media oh, okay. uh, in a way yeah. that could right. affect so, so there's the a difference, political difference dynamics. All right. That's right. I mean, so I think there is a problem of judges themselves using social media as a, uh, as a bully pulpit. Uh, some of our judges, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, for example, you know, who everybody loves, who's wonderful, but it was, I think, inappropriately using uh, the media in the past uh, to, to state a position, and, and we should put other, other judges have done that, and that's quite important uh, that, that uh, judges not themselves take on a kind of a PR responsibility uh, in connection with their, with their activities. So we, Thank you, Bonnie. We emphasize in the book the importance of the judiciary being independent. And that means that not only do they not depend on the president for their appointments, but they are separate from political parties and from any, any kind of influence and therefore can make their judgments based on the laws. Uh, I am not prepared, as Susan is also not prepared, to, to have an opinion on exactly what happened in Brazil in, in relation with the car wash case and the use of social media. But in general, it, social media shouldn't, and, and leaks to the media shouldn't be taking place during an ongoing investigation um, and certainly should not be used to express a position or to influence political, uh, political outcomes. Um, but beyond that, I think it's very important that the citizen should become much better educated in the use of social media and how to interpret what they're seeing uh, and, and to really be able to sort out what's important. Uh, Bolsonaro was elected on a very strong anti-corruption platform in the midst of, of, all of all of the scandal that was going on. And Matthew Stevenson wrote a blog during the, the campaign season in which he argued that sometimes anti-corruption isn't the most important thing. If anti-corruption, if voting for your anti-corruption candidate means that you end up with a populist authoritarian, then maybe the corruption is more tolerable because down the road, you could end up with even worse corruption. And so, um, in, in this sense, that's a space where organized society, civil society can step in and really try to sort out and evaluate the candidates in terms of, of where they really stand and what we can really expect from them. There was a, a very nice uh, a, a very nice app that was developed in Brazil during the electoral campaign that I thought was phenomenal, where the the voters or anyone could take a picture of a political candidate and automatically on the screen through this app, they could see whether they had been convicted of corruption. And so it was real time seeing who are these candidates and, and if they're talking about anti-corruption, is that really what they stand for? And so I think social media can be used and technology can be used to strengthen anti-corruption campaigns. Uh, and, and to give sort of a reality check on those candidates, but it needs to be used very carefully and it's too easy for it to be abused. Sure, thank you, thank you very much. And I, and I think it's, it's, it's really, I mean, to take care about authorities using uh, uh, social media uh, um, and, and, and trying to influence civil society. I think that's that's purely an issue that we need to be careful about, as Susan mentioned, about judges and prosecutors as well, right? If you're looking for impartial uh, and independent uh, assessment of these these issues. So let me turn to a second question. Uh, um, and and the question is, how do you see, I mean, you do a lot of comparative work uh, uh, during during the whole book. I think it's the first, the first edition was already uh, uh, very illustrated with case studies from all over the world. But then the second edition is just amazing in how you compare uh, uh, so many case studies and, and so much data from, from different countries. And this, I think this question comes into this uh, 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 comparative perspective 
and as how do you see Brazil into perspective comparing to other countries? I've been talking about first systemic corruption, right? I mean, at least from what you know about what was uncovered and in and, and, and Brazil and different corruption scandals. Uh, of course, uh, there's a lot of talk about car wash, but before that we had discussions in Salon, we have current discussions about COVID procurement, uh, 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 and so on and so forth. So how do you see Brazil in comparison to other contexts where you see systemic corruption? And also, how do you see anti-corruption corruption initiatives in Brazil in the context of how you see uh, these initiatives and reforms in other countries as well? So trying to have this uh, comparative perspective here. Um, once again, I don't think either of us has a firm answer on this, but um, I think you have to remember, Brazil is a middle income country. You have a, you have a pretty well-educated population, at least a good chunk of it. Um, uh, you have people of high quality in, in the operating in the bureaucracy and in the state institutions of the state and of, and, of, and, of, and of business. And one of the things that means is that there's space in there to actually carry out a, a serious anti-corruption drive. And I think La Vajado was that. Um, and um, it had, has an, had a very unfortunate ending or it, um, maybe it's not ending yet, but I mean developments that kind of undermined the, the claim that it was an impartial uh, uh, process um, led by uh, a high quality group of prosecutors. I've always pointed to the Brazilian example of the prosecutorial system as a good one, where it's a prestigious uh, body of, of lawyers to be part of. You know, you can enter this, as I understand it, with an exam out of, out of law school and so, you know, it's a it's a it's a group of of uh, on 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 balance. It's a, it's a it's a good way to have independent prosecutors. We don't have that in the U.S. at the federal level. They are political appointees, and at the state at the at the individual state level, many of them are elected. Um, um, so you've got some really strong uh, features of your system that that you need to uh, uh, you know um, maintain uh, themselves. I think unfortunately, some people who were involved in that system. Um, uh, had uh, uh, at least uh, uh, created the impression, I want uh, to once again take a firm stand here, but sort of created the impression that there was some kind of political uh, uh, ag agenda here. Uh, and that had a, uh, a very unfortunate uh, effect on the, on, the, uh, on, the, on the ordinary thing. But, you know, you shouldn't be too, I mean, obviously many of you are not happy <laughs> with the way things have, have, uh, have, have, have turned out and I'm certainly not, uh, not, not, not either, but there are some, some, uh, uh, some strengths which have not disappeared uh, in, the, uh, in the way the system is, uh, in the way the, the, uh, the structure is operated. I think, as I was saying in my remarks, that they, the, the problems are not so much the structure of the, of the, of the judiciary and the prosecutors as the, the, the way in which the political system operates uh, to, um, to create uh, uh, corrupt incentives. And if I were looking for a place to reform, uh, that would be where I'd look. Of course, it's hard to get politicians to agree to reform themselves, but you know, maybe that's what FJB should be doing, right? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a key issue. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with Susan. It's, it's really, um, it's difficult being outside of Brazil to, to have an opinion, a strong opinion. I see Brazil just looking at, at data and what I've read I see Brazil as being very similar to Mexico, with the exception of the judicial system. I think that the judicial system is too strong, but a lot of the same systemic uh, issues in, in corruption are present in Brazil. The anti-corruption initiatives, I think, are, are very strong. I've been a fan of Transparencia Brasil for decades, probably, at this point. Um, and, and I know that there are other anti-corruption uh, organizations working to to visualize the the problem and i know that the work of fjv is really really important the number of scholars who have been working on this issue for a while um, but systemic corruption is really hard to deal with especially when as susan pointed out it's the the congress people themselves who are going to have to vote for the reform and usually that comes after a scandal that's so big that they can't not 
reform. But we really have to watch out for reforms that, that are just facades, as we point out a few times in, in the book, that often anti-corruption reform is just a facade. It's just checking a box and then not really following through. And, and that's a problem that is prevalent throughout Latin America. Every single one of the Latin American countries has signed at least one of the three major anti-corruption agreements. And yet progress in the area of corruption has been patchy, slow, or non-existent. And in some countries, it's even gotten worse. Thank you, Bonnie and Susan. Uh, um, I have another question here uh, um, that's focused on the specific tool of uh, 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 fighting corruption, that would be the fourth non trial agreement. So what are your views about non trial agreements in combating corruption? Uh, um, of course, they were used quite a bit in Brazil throughout car wash investigation and other anti-corruption investigations. Uh, but I'd like to know this, this question is asking about your views on, on this particular tool. Um, uh, there's something that needs to be part of the toolkit of prosecutors. Um, there's a nice uh, book uh, recently out edited by Tina uh, Saraide and Mac, um, uh, Mac Makiwa uh, that is a quite balanced uh, look at the different pros and cons of this um, of this of, of, of this option, um, I think it needs to be seen in the context of what the underlying law is dealing with the crime of corruption and maybe with crime in, in general. Um, I mean, my conversations with some people in Brazil um, about the the difficulties of uh, criminal prosecutions um, pointed. To, uh, at least raised for me the possibility that there were certain things that ought to be reformed in that process so that the 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 process could go you know fa in a faster more sensible uh, way um you know uh, look looks like um the statute of limitations you know is too uh runs too fast right <laughs> and, and and it allows people to introduce all kinds of delays the people who are being accused in uh, to, to get beyond that. So there's things like that that are that I think need to be part of a discussion of non-trial uh, of, 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 of non-trial trial agreements. They also of course depend upon, at least in the US, upon judges approving them. Um, so we're not we're not getting judicial system isn't out of the picture. They're there to look at it. Um, and, and they should be and should be more uh, have uh, and, and perhaps need some more uh, um, Training or background and how to and how to evaluate uh, evaluate these things, but you know they're going to look more attractive to everybody the more cumbersome it is to actually have a trial, and more justified the more cumbersome it all you know this kind of messy it is to have a trial in ways that don't seem to really be deeply connected with the underlying un, un, underlying problem. So uh, so I, I there's certainly something needs to be um, I think in the in the shopping basket of of things that can be. That, that that can be done, but need to be. But they're not. It the, the needs to be seen in the light of the other characteristics of the criminal justice system, which may need reform. I agree with everything Susan just said. Um, and, and speaking out of my relative ignorance, uh, I would just add that I, I think that non-trial agreements and settlements are are abused in many cases, and I would like to see many more such settlements with the with an, an exception of guilt, of guilt, an acceptance of guilt, rather. Uh, I think that too many, especially corporate uh, defendants, use out-of-court settlements as a way to wipe the slate clean, and, and perhaps those settlements are not high enough to be a disincentive for them to continue and we see company after company settling over and over and over again and and if they're continuing to settle it's because they're continuing with that bad behavior so i think that yes the trial system is cumbersome perhaps that needs to be reformed i think a big problem with many countries is that there simply are not enough judges and prosecutors to move the cases forward more quickly um, so judicial reform 
is important uh, to, to address that as well. Thank you very much. Um, we have time for one more question uh, before we, we come to an end. Uh, and the question that I have here is um, going back to, to Bonnie's uh, uh, initial presentation, the question asks, uh, what's the distinction, Bonnie, uh, between institutions and incentives in Professor Felipka's last slide? Aren't the incentives provided by formal and informal institutions in this context? So this, this is uh, uh, about the distinction about incentives and, and institutions. Of course, Susan, uh, feel free to, to jump in uh, uh, as well. It's just referring to... Yeah, my, I see. Sure. My. So I, I think it's easiest to refer to the slide more specifically. Institutions are society-wide institutions. They're the fundamental base of a society. So formal institutions include the laws, the legal structure, they include the political structure, the rules that are written down, uh, protocols, regulations, those are all formal institutions. Informal institutions include things like the rule of law. To what extent do people take serious following the law and following rules and other cultural aspects of, of a society? Incentives are more specific to a particular situation. And they're often shaped by institutions. So there are interactions between the institutions and the incentives. And also personal ethics can be shaped by institutions and by incentives. So some of the incentives that have been signaled in the literature as, as leading to higher levels of corruption include low salaries. This is especially true when when public servants are not earning a subsistence wage but we see many wealthier public servants and people even in the private sector engaging in corruption even though they're, they're making high salaries so it's not a guarantee um, coming out of robert clitgard's work the combination of monopoly power over a service or a resource, the discretion to exercise that power, and the lack of accountability in relation to the exercise, the discrete exercise of that mon monopoly power. Those three incentives combine to lead toward higher levels of corruption. So one, one way to reform, obviously, is to make people more accountable. You introduce more monitoring or um, or once, once they are caught, you make the sanctions higher, right? So it's more punishable to be caught in an act of corruption. You can reduce the discretion by using e-government tools, for example. Um, and you can reduce monopoly power, and this goes back even to the first edition, by giving users options in terms of which public servant, if we're talking about the bureaucracy, which bureaucrat you go to you know, if it's as simple as going to the next window over to not have to pay that extorted bribe, then that helps to reduce corruption. So uh, again, those incentives are generally more specific to a situation. We can talk also about incentives that the Congress faces, as we've referred to already, you know, should, should they vote for reform if that's going to mean that more of them are going to end up in prison? probably not right and then you have to look from the civil society point of view what how can we change those incentives so that congress has a an incentive to change the fundamental institutions that need to be changed right so so getting out the vote publicizing what needs to be done and what kinds of laws we've had some successful uh efforts here in in mexico and specifically in my state here in nuevo leon of civil society pressuring the and working with actually negotiating with congress to improve the laws so i i hope that that uh, yeah i mean i think i think the only thing i would say is that you although the, the chart makes it looks as, as if every little arrow is like a separate little silo but in fact uh we don't mean to uh create you know are we that's not the right impression to be taking away um obviously there is a a, a big 
intersection, I mean, which was implied by the question, I think the question, the question's right, that there's a way in which institutional structure uh, has an impact on the incentives, but there also are difference between the level at which we're talking about institutions at the level of the state itself uh, or the society itself and the particular manifestations in particular areas. And so there to go to really make progress, you need to put those two things together. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, maybe we could just have a final uh, uh, round of remarks. Uh, uh, just to conclude, we're coming to an end of our time uh, here. And just before uh, wrapping up, uh, we could have a, 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 a final round um, here. Susan, Bonnie, do you like to kick off? And then we have Oscar and, and, and Cesar here as well. Um. Yeah, just just a way of wrapping up, uh, Susan. Do you have okay, any just, I, don't have, I mean, other than just to thank you, um, uh, and um, I I'm certainly hope that some people out here in the audience are actually doing research on some of these questions. Uh, maybe with uh, the case of Brazil and uh, Bonnie and I would love to hear from you uh, what you're doing, what you found out. I guess some of that will show up over the, the conference happening over the next uh, the next few days. Uh, it's impossible to keep up on all the current things, but uh, but you can you can try to uh, to let us know what you're doing, and that would be that would be great. And thank you, um, Oscar and Kyo and FJV uh, generally uh, for, uh, for, uh, for for organizing this and for masterminding it in the beginning. I I uh, very much very much uh, very much appreciate it, and I'm looking forward to coming to Brazil, you know, sometime soon. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> Again. We too, Bonnie. And again, thanks to, to Susan, to our translator, to, to Caio and Oscar at, at FGV, and to all of the organizers of this. Uh, many, many thanks. And, and just to repeat to those of you in the audience that the book has lasting lessons and insights. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the original edition from 1999 is still cited in current publications. And so we have lessons that can be applied moving forward with the, the scandals and the events of the next decade or so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cesar. Just want to join Bonnie and Susan in thanking the organizers, Kyle, Oscar, and everyone who made this event possible. And, and just uh, highlight the fact that uh, the book is appearing in a particularly tumultuous time for Brazilian democracy, rule of law, and even constitutional uh, life, uh, in which many of the insights on institutional uh, reform and, um, and its relationship with um, the, not only the fight against corruption, but with the survival of, of basic guarantees of democratic life, from freedom of the press to uh, judicial independence uh, and so on uh, could not be more alive for civil society and for academia uh, in Brazil now. So uh, best of luck with the use of, of, of the book in, in research and, and teaching and also in advocacy to preserve you know, what Brazil has uh, achieved over the years and decades in terms of judicial independence, freedom of the press, civil liberties, and um, uh, that we've all admired around the world for so many years. Thank you, Oscar. Oh, um, once again, I would like to, to thank uh, the authors, uh, their generosity, their efforts to put this book uh, together, uh, their decision to come with us on this uh, translation. It is uh, a seminal book. Uh, 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 also, as Bonnie, I, I, I got a copy of this book many, many, many years ago and, and really changed my perspective on how to understand uh, corruption. And I think this new edition with uh, uh, the comparative amazing work that you have done uh, really expanded the horizons of the study of, of, of corruption. And so it is a, a major achievement and it is wonderful that we can make it available uh, to the Brazilian public at, at, at this moment. 
as we all agree uh, what has happened at the criminal level with all its, um, we can discuss and have arguments about uh, uh, the effectivity, but we, uh, we, we, we probably have a consensus that in any circumstance, uh, what happened at the criminal level is insufficient to deal with a much larger phenomena of, of, of corruption. And I think the book is particular fruitful for those who are engaging in, um, in an agenda of administrative reform, of uh, competition law, of uh, uh, transparency. And this is what many of the countries uh, that uh, are dealing with uh, uh, systematic corruption should be focusing on uh, without neglecting uh, the importance of the criminal law. So I think that the, the book really opens an uh, enormous agenda and it will be very uh, uh, beneficial uh, for Brazil uh, uh, at this moment. I would like to, to also thank you, my dear friend, uh, Cesar. Uh, it's wonderful that at least we can see each other uh, on the screen after so many years. Uh, and uh, um, you always uh, uh, introduce the theme to the, the most expensive way, bringing uh, a, a larger perspective on the issues and was not different with the corruption today. So thank you, Cesar, for, for being here. Thank you, my dear friend, Caio, to, to modeling uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this debate and also uh, uh, to uh, Professor Marieta, who was the hero to uh, uh, engage in this translation. So thank you all. And I welcome those who will keep with us in, in, in the conference uh, that will be a very, uh, uh, I think, interesting moment to, dis to, to, to deep the discussions that we started here. So thank you and have a nice day. Thank you very much, Oscar. Uh, thank you, our guests, uh, Susan, Bonnie, and Cesar. This is a great uh, conversation. Thank you, Oscar. Just finished by thanking Oscar uh, Vidana Vieira for uh, supporting this project and, and from the beginning and being enthusiastic about it and, and, and being part of this, this whole project. And also thank the conference organizers, Marta Machado, Raquel Pimenta, Kevin Davis, and Mariana Prado. It's always an amazing enterprise to put together a conference like this. And when we're doing this in the distance with people from all over the world in different time zones, uh, putting together only the logistics is already very complicated. So thank you so much for putting this together and opening space for this book launch uh, in the conference. We wish you all uh, have a great conference in the next few days. Uh, we restart with the conference at 2 p.m. for those that are participating. Uh, so we, we hope to see you all there and have a great and continue this conversation actually throughout the conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.